In this video, we're going to talk about how the campaign finance system in America works, and we're going to answer the question, is campaign finance legalized corruption? America, land of the free, home of the brave, and cradle of democracy. Is it really? With ever-increasing amounts of money being spent on election campaigns, with most of it coming from billionaires and special interests, money in politics has emerged as a hot topic in America. Do the massive amounts of money spent on elections by billionaires subvert our democracy? Are special interests using campaign finance to buy elections and buy politicians? Or is it just harmless lobbying? And what can we do about it? In short, is campaign finance legalized corruption? So before we get into the discussion on corruption, let's do a quick overview on how campaign finance works. So in America, there's basically five ways to make political contributions. Number one is individual contributions directly to a campaign that are limited to $2,800 per election cycle. Number two is donating to a political party, which is limited to $35,500 a year. Now, these first two methods are relatively transparent and have clear limits on how much individuals can give. On top of that, it's also illegal for corporations to give money to political campaigns. So what if you're a billionaire or a corporation and you want to give more? Enter the Political Action Committee, or PAC. With a PAC, you can not only give money directly to a campaign, but you can run your own advertisements supporting a political candidate. This is called electioneering, or hard money, because it's used to support a specific candidate. But this is subject to limitations. But if you use the money not to support a specific candidate, but rather an issue, then it's called soft money, and it's not subject to limitations. For example, rather than giving money to a PAC that supports, let's say, Ted Cruz, you could give money to a PAC that supports gun rights. It achieves the same goal, electing a pro-gun candidate, but without all those pesky regulations getting in the way. So the advantage of a PAC is that you can spend unlimited amounts of money as long as that money is not used for electioneering. But what if you don't want any limitations on contributions or spending? That's why there are super PACs, which unlike PACs, can spend unlimited amounts on both hard and and soft money. But a super PAC is not allowed to coordinate with a political campaign. Now, of course, you can get around that rule because the people who run super PACs are usually just ex-consultants from the same campaign. But a problem with super PACs, if you're a billionaire, is that even if you spend unlimited sums of money, your donations have to be publicly disclosed. Now, if you're a billionaire or a corporation, you don't want everyone knowing which politicians you support. So that's why there are 501c4s. These are basically tax-exempt nonprofits that don't have to disclose the identity of their donors or how they spend their money, so long as less than 50% of their money is spent on politics. So these have zero transparency and are called dark money. But so how is all this possible? Why aren't there laws against this? Well, it's because of a Supreme Court decision. And no, it's not Citizens United. It's the Buckley versus Vallejo decision from 1974, which states that although laws limiting how much money you can give to a campaign are fine, laws that limit how much money you can spend on electioneering is a violation of free speech rights. Do you see the distinction? It's not okay to give unlimited amounts of money to a specific candidate. But according to the Supreme Court, it is okay to spend unlimited amounts of money advertising on behalf of the candidate or issue. In other words, money is speech, and limiting money spending is limiting free speech. All that the Citizens United decision did in 2010 was rule that any limitations on corporations giving soft money were also unconstitutional. But this decision was decades in the making. Okay, but so if this money is not being spent directly on campaigns, how does it impact elections? Well, as a rule, money wins elections. Now, this isn't always the case at the presidential level, but in 2012, 
95% of congressional races were won by the candidate with the most money. Now, this wouldn't be a problem if all that money was coming from ordinary American citizens. But just 800,000 people, or 0.26% of the population, accounted for 68% of campaign spending. Contributions from normal people don't matter. In 2012, just 28% of Obama's and 12% of Mitt Romney's campaign money came from people donating less than $200. That means that the rich have far more influence over the political system. Now, it's true that candidates with more money winning doesn't necessarily mean that money was the deciding factor that made them win. Correlation does not equal causation. Donors might simply be more interested in donating to candidates who are already more likely to win. But that still opens the possibility for corruption. Because in that case, donors are not giving money to make someone win, but they are giving money to someone they know will win in order to gain influence over that person. For it to be corrupt, we would have to prove that the money actually influences politicians. And there's several ways that this happens. A study by Princeton University found that there is no correlation between the will of the majority of the American people and the policies implemented. But there is a correlation between the will of the rich and the policies adopted. For example, if a policy is supported by the rich, it has a 45% chance of being adopted. But if it's not supported by the rich, it only has an 18% chance of being adopted. Is a country where the interests of the elite dominate the policies that are implemented really a democracy? Now, to be fair, in the study, the rich and the middle class agree on many things. But when the rich and the middle class disagree on a policy, the rich win 53% of the time. And it's not just this study or ordinary people who view campaign contributions as having an influence on politicians. It's donors themselves. Among donors who gave over $250 to a candidate, 63% believe that their representatives would help them with a problem, compared to just 37% of the general population. So they understand that their representatives are more likely to help them if they give money. And this was confirmed in a study by UC Berkeley. They did a randomized controlled trial, so they called up members of Congress and randomly chose whether or not to tell them that they were a donor. When a caller was revealed to be a donor, they were four times more likely to get a meeting with the chief of staff and two times more likely to get a meeting with the congressperson themselves. Members of Congress spend up to four hours a day calling up rich people to donate money to their campaigns or super PACs instead of passing legislation to benefit the American people. Do you think that when a rich person picks up the phone during call time, that they're going to give money to a politician who's hostile to their interests? Conversely, do you think that if a politician gets a call from a big donor, that he's going to ignore that person? No, and this study shows that. You see, it's not that money necessarily directly buys you policies, but it does buy you access and access allows you to lobby for your policies. You see, the influence of big money means that politicians have an incentive to legislate in favor of those who will raise money for them. In Dutch, we have a saying, wiens brood men eet, wiens woord men spreekt, which literally means whose bread one eats, whose word one speaks, but roughly translates to people don't bite the hand that feeds them. So long as politicians continue to receive money from special interests, they will continue to legislate in favor of those special interests. Because if they don't, they lose that money. And corporations give to both sides to ensure that they always have a say in the administration, no matter who wins. Which makes it clear that they're not giving out of the goodness of their hearts. They expect something in return. Just like politicians, I'm also incentivized by the people who finance me. And that's why you should become a Patreon, so that I will always be beholden to your interests. But back to business. Okay, maybe you're skeptical. Are there any concrete examples of money influencing political decisions? 
Well, I'll show you three. Number one, of the 217 ambassadorships under Obama, 31 were given to people who were big money bundlers and another 39 to political appointees instead of people with diplomatic experience. And these ambassadorships were disproportionately in cushy Western countries. A good example of this is George Tsunis, who raised $1.3 million for Obama and was nominated as ambassador to Norway, despite having no diplomatic experience and knowing nothing about the country. And this practice is common, not just Obama. You raise money for a president, you get a cushy diplomatic position. Quid pro quo. Number two, Cory Booker. In 2017, Bernie Sanders proposed a bill that called for the importation of cheaper prescription drugs from Canada. This would make medicine cheaper for Americans, but it would also hurt the profits of pharmaceutical companies. Despite the fact that 72% of Americans support importing cheaper drugs from Canada, Cory Booker voted against it because it didn't include provisions to check the safety of these imported drugs. The problem with that reasoning, though, is that the drugs imported from Canada are usually manufactured in the U.S. and have the same safety standards. Conveniently, though, Cory Booker received $267,000 from the pharmaceutical industry, more than any other Democrat. Number three, guns. In America, the overwhelming majority support gun regulation, with over 83% supporting universal background checks and 72% supporting gun licenses. Yet this legislation is never passed. Why? Well, members of Congress have received over $5.6 million to oppose gun regulation and only $240,000 in favor of gun regulation. Money wins out, even if the majority of the American people want something. And in this case, it's the Republican Party that is owned by the National Rifle Association, the NRA, that has given millions to Republican politicians. Campaign finance, or rather the ability of billionaires and corporations to give unlimited sums of money, is undermining the American democracy. Elites have far more influence over politicians than ordinary people, and it has real policy implications. And we see this with the coronavirus bailout package. Big money ensures that the politicians who get elected are beholden to their donors. Legalized corruption. This means that equal political rights are a fantasy. If one person can drown out the voice of millions just because they have more money, then that's not a democracy. It's an oligarchy. But there is hope. Most Americans want to limit campaign spending, with over 77% supporting laws to limit campaign spending. There are potential solutions, including publicly financed elections, abolishing super PACs via a constitutional amendment, and even Andrew Yang's proposal for democracy dollars, which would allocate a certain amount of money to every American that they could choose to donate to a candidate of their choice. Equal money, equal voice, equal influence. That is democracy. But the only way you'll get it is if you fight for it. Thank you to our Patreons for donating. Like, share, and subscribe. Because this was my take. <laughs>